Hi, welcome everybody to uh, my talk, uh, Stairway to Heaven, 10 Best Practices for Enterprise Continuous Delivery with Jenkins. I guess that's what you get when you get the uh, marketing guy to uh, put the abstract together. So uh, I'm here on a graveyard shift, so um, I'll try and make it as interesting as possible for the next 45 minutes, but thanks for being here. So a little bit about me. Um, I'm a VP of Product Development at uh, Midvision. Um, I've worked in deployment automation for about 10 years, and prior to that, I was um, a Java developer, um, Java architect, deployer, you know, all things Java. So I've worked on both sides of the DevOps um, fence. And uh, there's a picture of me in a pub, typical British UK man. Okay, uh, so at Midvision we have uh, a tool, a release automation tool, this is not a pitch about uh, our tool, no matter how cool it is, but we do, I do have experience working with enterprise um, deployments. Um, we are a company that's born in the bank, so we have a lot of regulation, we understand about what regulation and compliance is required for deployment, deploying into enterprise-wide systems. Um, Recently, we were uh, awarded a, a, cool, uh, a cool vendor by Gartner. <laughs> okay, so okay, so uh, I'm going to talk about three things today. Um, first thing is uh, setting the scene with continuous delivery, what it means to most people, and what it means to me. Um, then I'm going to go on to the 10 steps, I've got 10 points, which hopefully will guide you through some principles um, when you're choosing to integrate and implement continuous delivery in your organisation and some things you should look out for. And if I've got time at the end, I'm going to go into some real scenarios um, from simplex and uh, simple and complex um, deployment scenarios. Now, my specialist field is deployment, so there are lots of different parts of continuous delivery, but my expertise is in the deployment, and so that's what I'll be talking about afterwards, if we have time. So, starting off, what is continuous delivery? I don't know when I click the button, it seems to go too far, okay. Right, so, continuous delivery, we all know what continuous integration is, um, it's really the complete application release process from your source code commits right through to application deployment into production. It's about speeding up change from the inception of an idea that someone in the business has, implementing it through your IT systems and getting it out the door in front of the customers as quickly as possible. And to do this, you implement a process, you try to automate the process, and you chain those process steps together. Um, you can create pipelines for these process steps together, there's tools to do it, you've seen Jenkins. Um, and it's about having all of the configuration as code. Um, every configuration change should be version controlled, uh, locked and fingerprinted uh, in your source control systems. So, <laughs> so, what's going on here? Apologies. Maybe instead of using the arrows, um, you have the uh, present mode. Just click the uh, click the arrows on the presenting screen instead of the arrows on the keyboard. Okay. Yep, I'll do that. No, that's fine as well. Okay. I don't know why. Okay. So, um, so here's a here's a, a process. Um, you have your continuous integration to start with. You've got your developer, which will commit code, which is source control, which will trigger a build, and your build engine of choice, which ultimately. Uh, develop, create a package, and that's your release package of all of your artifacts that you then push through every single stage in your pipeline. And your pipeline can be as short as long as you define it to be. So they're your testing environment, your system test, integration test, um, user, user acceptance, performance test, staging, all the way through to production. 
And every time you go to one of those environments, you need to deploy your code, you then need to run your set of tests, and then you need to decide, you know, how to get a checkpoint, how to it successful or not, and then you go to the next environment, and then you may need approvals around, are you allowed to deploy to that environment or not? So continuous delivery is about automating this process and putting the tools together so that you can um, uh, deploy and, and release as quickly as possible. Okay, so why, why are we doing this? So this is obviously quite prevalent at the moment. Um, continuous de deployment, continuous delivery is high in the sea level agenda. Um, if it's implemented correctly, it can be a game changer for organisations because you no longer have uh, your ideas taking six months to be uh, released into uh, your customers. You can react to the market quickly. Um, by, by releasing quickly. Um, you'll be releasing higher quality, better, lower defect software because everything's automated, everything's repeatable. Um, all of the automation processes carried out by IT it will be removing the errors and it will be speeding up your time to market. You'll um, speed up the change, you'll uh, eliminate outages, you'll, um, uh, the waste and rework that you have when you uh, deployments fail or when you're um, manually kicking off tests or manually uh, doing your approval steps um, because they're all automated will reduce time and thus reduce your, your, your costs. And, and you get an early return on investment by um, implementing and spending on continuous delivery. You do reap the benefits um, quite quickly. Okay. Right, so I'm going to talk about the 10 steps now of um, continuous delivery. The first step is choose what you're going to automate. So there are many things you can automate. There's, I mean, most people should be automating building code, um, provisioning environments, um, deploying your code into configuration, your approval process, uh, testing, unit testing, selenium testing, performance testing, Approval processes, uh, you know, all of these things can be automated. You just need to choose the right things to automate. And you've got to choose whether it's worth automating. I mean, you want to automate everything, but it's right to just take the, the big wins first. And I'd say if you have a process which is broken, so if you have some scripts that you're using which um, are pretty flaky and keep breaking, don't build upon that. Fix those scripts first, and, and then build your process around it. Um, it. It might not be possible to automate everything. Um, I've worked, I've deployed with some technologies you just cannot deploy. Um, you cannot automate deployment. You have to go on and um, do some steps manually. The cost of not automating um, can be quite expensive, especially as a lot of people are doing it now. There's a lot of technical debt out there by, by not doing it, and by automating your, your, automating your process, you are um, removing that technical debt. Um, you've got to use a tool like Jenkins to interconnect your jobs uh, to, to build up your automation delivery pipelines. Now, I, didn't, I wasn't aware of this workflow plugin, plugin that we, we heard about today, so obviously make use of the workflow plugin, don't change your jobs, new way of doing things. Okay. So the next um, step is <laughs> the uh, deployment paradigm. Okay. So when you do do your deployments to your test systems, your development systems, your uh, production systems, you've got to think about how are you going to do the, the deployment? Are you going to push out your changes or are you going to pull out your changes? There are different tools that do things differently. Okay, so you, you can have a directive content model and that's when changes are managed centrally and these are, uh, your changes are pushed out to your target systems. They're useful when you've, uh, you want to orchestrate different deployments to different components and um, it's useful when you've got um, inter interconnecting dependencies within your deployment. So you can't deploy X until deploy, you've deployed something previous. That's a good um, indicator that you want to use these. 
use directed model. There's a con convergent model, which is where um, state is managed centrally on a, on a central server, and you have agents that will poll the masters and uh, update the definitions uh, if they've seen that the server state has changed or its state has changed to what the server says it should be. Um, using that model is useful for when you've got uh, more um, straightforward um, applications that need to configure. Um, if you have highly complex applications, I'm not sure that that's the best uh, model to be using. Um, a, a convergent model works better in uh, homogeneous environments. So if you're doing things at massive scale, then uh, the convergent method is, is uh, better as a directive approach because you know, in a directive approach, you'd have to spawn multiple threads and open multiple sockets if you have, you know, thousands, tens of thousands of nodes that you're, you're maintaining, then directive approach may not be the best way of doing things. So think about what you're deploying um, and think about whether you want to be using a directive or convergent way of um, deploying. simply modify files on the file system. Um, complex middleware systems normally require uh, their own API to do deployments, and so you have to talk to that API to do deployments. You can't just um, manage a set of files and tokenize those set of files to push out to a different environment to uh, replace the tokens for your specific environments. So think about the technology that you're deploying to. And normally, it's the product which will determine the type of deployment that you're uh, deploying to. Okay, so um, here in this diagram we've got uh, this package, uh, and it goes back to build once, deploy anywhere uh, principle, where you create your package, uh, and it should be created just the once, and that same package is pushed out to all of your um, environments in the pipeline, and it should not be tampered with. Uh, you want the integrity of the package to stay the same. You should not be changing that package from a test environment to production. So you know that what has been tested, what is in production, has been tested throughout all of those environments. Um, it, a, a package, so if I go back just one, uh, a package should be a single compressed file. It should be version locked, um, and you should it should be checksum and when you do create the package you're packaging up all of your configuration from your source control system and ideally you want to be labeling your source control system at the same time you're creating the package so that you and you should be storing the source control um, commit uh, uh, number into your package normally in the manifest so that you can trace back um, your package and what's being deployed to a version with your source control. Okay, so the package should contain all of the instructions that's required to deploy to all of the environments. Um, it should be a model that uh, is environment agnostic, so it should have all of the instructions and set of steps that's required to deploy to all of your environments you know, throughout the pipeline. Um, it should uh, contain all of the configuration for those environments and resources or if it doesn't contain resources like wall files, it should have the address locations so it knows where to pull those resources from when it's doing the deployment. Um, it's, uh, it should be a standalone process so that you're not tied to your uh, deployment tool. You should be able to run it anywhere. You should be able to plug it into any part of your process. And when you do create it, you then store it into your DSL, your definitive software library. You've got lots of tools out there to use, um, Artifactory, Nexus, um, Maven, a 
secure remote file system, wherever, whatever you use, once it's packaged, it should be stored in a secure location. Okay. So the next um, thing to talk about is uh, the packaging model. So um, this normally is determined by uh, top topology and environment you're deploying to. So in simple, single application, single, single cluster type environments, you can deploy your uh, application and your configuration together. Often you've got an application that would have uh, references to resources like data sources, queues, etc. And what you should do is you, you can deploy that configuration together, make sure the configuration is there. If it's not there, create a configuration in your containers and then deploy the applications so that they can work together. But then there are times that you, you want to deploy multiple applications together and the churn on the application change is bigger than the churn on the configuration change. And in these scenarios, you want to think about separating out your configuration away from your uh, code that you're deploying um, because you don't want to be um, you know, creating the configuration lots of times if it's not changing um, very much. And, and really you want to um, think about what are the interconnecting dependencies between the, the deployments. If there are things that can be deployed standalone and keep that as a separate package to be deployed and then just chain your deployment jobs together in the process of the tool that you're using. So uh, the, the next step is um, resource testing uh, and resource testing your environment. So um, what you need to do is uh, test your deployment resources. So think about what resources you may need in your deployment. So I'm thinking about things like um, file space, simple things, uh, user accounts. Um, does a user have access to the file system that you require? Um, does your application have um, ports that need to be used? You can test all of these things before you do the actual deployment. And uh, not many people do uh, add this, and we, I've called it a, a, a dry run, but it does save a lot of time, because if you get halfway through a complex deployment, it's very hard to unpick what's been done and what files have been put there. And if you can, you know, put some gates in, in place before the deployment, and these are the sort of quality gates that we do, testing these resources can save a lot of time. You don't always know what environment, what resources you need, and it's not until you've done your 20th deployment that you run out of space and you realise actually you need to have a certain amount of space in the temp directory, that you can then um, go and retrospectively put that into your uh, deployment dry run. Um, so that it's, it's just something that's progressively keep adding as, um, as the application deployment process um, develops. So the next uh, thing is automated testing. Now obviously we're trying to automate everything. Um, Jenkins has a lot of um, plugins around the space. Uh, I've said here there's a lot of Post build plugins, chain jobs plugins, obviously there's now the workflow plugin as well um, to, to parallelize your deployments. One of the tools that we've used is using the um, parameterized matrix within Jenkins. And so you um, have parameterized builds and then you create a matrix. Um, so you may have a matrix of uh, databases, you know, MySQL, Oracle, DB2. Another part of that matrix may be um, the architecture, 32-bit versus 64-bit, um, the type of JDK you're using. All of these different variables makes the matrix bigger, and you, suddenly you've got 9, 18, you know, more and more versions of the application that you need to test. So if you use a, a parameterized matrix, it's a really useful way of, um, of uh, parallelizing, testing all the different versions of your application, so I'd recommend using that. And if you do use that, um, you, there's a, a good little tool where you can have um, a, a touch tone build, which basically you can say, okay, I want to check my Oracle 64-bit version on a, um, I don't know, uh, 
uh, on a uh, Chrome browser works first. And so you make that the touchstone build, and what it will do is it will take your matrix and it will just check that run first, and if that's successful, it will then run all of the uh, other uh, text in the matrix. This is just a, um, a pretty cool tool uh, to parallelize your, your automation. So I've said here, pipelines can be built to um, can be quick to build, but the, the, the painful bit that I've experienced is converting all of the manual tests to automation, um, especially if you don't have any testing automation. But stick with it. Um, it may take months, it may take years. You really will reap the benefits if you get started on, um, on, on automation. And uh, again, it's a uh, uh, choose your quick wins. You know, just do the quick testing you can do. Get that automation, get the framework in place, and then build on it slowly. Okay. So the next step in the automation is uh, approvals and compliance. Now, this is often uh, the last thing that will be automated in, in the process. There are a lot of tools that allow you to uh, have approvals. Jenkins has an approval plugin that you can use. There are a lot of other tools that you can use. In all of the enterprises that I've worked in, I've worked in um, banks and healthcare organisations, they all require approvals from their controlled environments. And that starts from user acceptance testing to the stage performance to staging to UAT. And whether it's automated or not, you need to have that process in place. And uh, a good idea is to have a process that allows for more than one uh, group of people to do the approvals. Because generally you'll have relief managers, you'll have project managers, you'll have change managers that all have a say in whether something can get released. And so if you have this process in place, um, it's, it's, it, it, it's great to have, but you also need to have it recorded and audited. So you can go back and you can see, you know, Joe Blogs approved this deployment into production along with a change manager and it happened on these dates and the deployment happened at this date. So you really should be um, auditing uh, the approval requests and approval decisions. It, it's mandatory for, for um, compliance in a lot of these environments. So um, approvals are not just for Deployments. You can also um, have approval steps for changing your release configuration. So you may have a problem in a production environment and a developer may come along and do help out with the, the ops guys and identify what the problem is. And it may be that they need to increase the, I don't know, JVM heap size or you know, simple property. So what you can do is you can have tools where you can get these users to request the changes to the release configuration. And again, that can be audited, uh, well, approved and audited. And so you can see who's made changes to your release configuration. And changes to release configuration, a small change can have a massive impact. So it, it's you know, great to have um, a, 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 a way of tracking that change and understand who did it and when. So I've got simple Deployment process, deployment approval process, um, changes from organisation to organisation. But here, you may have uh, you want to do a deployment. Has the deployment been approved? Is the first step. If it has, then you want to ideally automate the deployment, or you manually kick off the deployment. If that's successful, then generally you um, do the testing, and ideally you want that automated, and then have the test pass. If they've not passed, then you've got a question mark. Do you want to roll back? Is there a rollback available? If there's not, then you manually have to go and change, uh, roll back your environment. If there is, you then automate the rollback. If your tests do pass, then it's go on to the next environment within the pipeline. Is there another environment in the pipeline? Is there, if there is, is re are approvals required for that um, environment? And so the, the loop continues. I mean, it's funny, I see, um, on, on some of these um, talks I've been today, to today, I've seen a lot of people talk about we've got build, and then we've got test, and then we've got release, and that or deploy, uh, uh, and that deploy is just deploying into production. But what you've got is you've got build, 
deploy to your first test environment, test in your first test environment, get approval for your next environment, deploy in that environment, so you know, the deployment and the testing, so um, the, 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 the final deployment is generally the production deployment. Okay. So step nine is um, rollback strategy. So uh, a rollback depends on technology, in my experience. So um, I'll talk about databases uh, firstly, because databases are notoriously hard to roll back. Um, what I'd say is, if you implement a database change and then it's been running for a while and some business data has been added or amended to your database, then generally you can't roll back because you will lose that data. Um, and I was in that scenario I would say it needs CDA. Um, you um, can make your database changes backwards compatible, so you don't need to delete uh, columns that aren't used anymore. You don't need to delete the tables. They can sit there for a while um, while uh, you know you can leave them there until you do a few more deployments and everything, you're happy with everything and then you can remove them. But if you do delete them, you've deleted that data. And unless you're taking an export of the data, you then need to do a, a re-import. Now, what I like to do is use database tools um, to, and database deployment tools to uh, manage the state of deployments and, and manage the ability to do rollback. There are many tools on the market, I'm not going to talk about them, but what they do is they, uh, when you do a, a, a deployment, they will, or, or you're running some scripts into an environment, it will maintain the state of running that script in the database. So you run script one, a table gets populated, script run one, checksums, data is done, and then it runs script two, the, the state table is updated. And the next time you do a deployment, if you have script three and four, it looks at the table and says, I've already run the first two scripts, so I won't bother with that, I'll just run the next one. So these are, there are great tools on the market that you can use to do that, and I would recommend to do that. The only problem that I've encountered is uh, DBAs are often <laughs> very um, uh, controlling over their environments and you have to get the buy-in and the inputs of the DBAs to be allowed to use such tools. And again with these tools, um, the database tools, th there are some that allow you to have, you create a statement, you can also um, create a rollback statement as well. And so it, with those tools you can just run your rollback using, using uh, those tools. But I, you know, in my experience, it's always been a fixed forward policy with databases, um, especially in these uh, regulated enterprise environments that I've been working in. So um, with middleware uh, deployments, you can generally roll back, especially if you have a deployment model where you're deploying the configuration with the application. Because you, when you do your deployment, you know that your application resources will be there because you'll deploy the configuration. So you'll deploy your JMS queues, you'll deploy your data sources, and then you deploy the application on top. So for a rollback, in that instance, you just need to check the previous version of the package and redeploy it. If you do break up the package, the configuration, and code, you just have to ensure that you've, you're at the right level of configuration when you roll back the application. So the final step is uh, about gathering metrics uh, and, and analysing the process that you've implemented because it's quite an expensive business and it's quite laborious to put in uh, continuous delivery in place and often you need to build a business case for your, your business sponsors and, and what you want to do is is you want to measure the process, and so there are reports that you can get out of Jenkins that you know, the velocity of deployments, how many deployments have taken place, the number of successful deployments, the number of failed deployments. Um, you want to gather this information together, and you want to report on it back to um, the business owners, and you want to show them 
the impact that automating this process is having. I, I, I worked for one um, uh, client and they had a, a deployment process of six days because they had so many multiple moving parts. They were deploying um, Siebel, uh, process server, um, DB, uh, Oracle changes, um, Doc1, Adobe, and they used to, it was a, a typical organization where they had developers and testers in one organization and they'd throw things over the wall to another organization to do the deployment with a big manual of these are the steps you had to take. Invariably, people would make mistakes with these steps and it took six days. And just by automating the deployment, we got it down to um, six hours. I mean, it's still quite long, but, you know, it was uh, light years away from what they had before. And suddenly, deployments happened in the weekend rather than the weekend. So when you have these metrics and you give them back to the business, you know, you, you will reap the benefits. Um, and I just say make use of all the reports that you can get out of Jenkins so that you can report back. Okay. So the ten steps we talked about is working out what to automate, choose the low-hanging fruit. Uh, and then build upon it. Work out which is the best approach, whether you're going to do the directive, which is the push method, or the convergent method, the deployment call method. Work out what you're deploying. So it, it depends on the product that you are deploying. It depends on whether you're using file-based or, or API-based deployments. Build one, build once, and deploy anywhere, and deploy everywhere. Take that same package and deploy it through all of your environments. Do not make changes to that package or the integrity of the package between all of your different environments. Work out the best packaging model, so about whether you deploy the configuration with the code or split them up. Um, it's up to you in your environment. Do the prerequisite resource testing, environment testing. It, it saves so much time in, in failed deployments. Implement automated testing. No matter how hard or long it's going to take, start doing it now. Just put the framework together and start building upon it. Have a rollback strategy in place. Database tools, I would recommend you use some of the um, tools on the market. And then have an approval process. If you can, have an automated approval process and then measure what you've done throughout this whole uh, continuous delivery um, journey and report back on it to, to your business stakeholders. Get more investing, more investment, more funding so that you can do more work in this area. Okay, so next section I'm going to talk about uh, deployment scenarios. Okay, deployment scenarios. And I'm going to start off with a simple case, and then I'm going to go on to a, a complex deployment scenario. And uh, I do, you know, I, I, I don't work at a Netflix or a Google, I work at uh, big enterprises which often have these huge monolithic uh, application servers which have a lot of configuration. <laughs> WebSphere application server just happens to be one of them, so this is the example I'm going to talk about. So it's a multi-node system, um, uh, WebSphere, and the installation process itself is not simple. You can't just take an RPM package or a zip file and unzip it and it's installed. You have to use other tools to install it. You have to set up and configure the cell. You have to create all of your security policies each of the nodes in the system, and then you have to federate your nodes back into the cell. So just doing the installation process can have thousands of configuration items that you need to manage. So it, just installing um, the software is, is hard enough. And all of these configuration changes can have a massive impact. So as I mentioned earlier, JVM heap size, you get that wrong, you suddenly you know, bust your server you've eaten up all the memory on that server. Again, increasing the cluster count, suddenly you've got more, more instances, it's going to use up more resources on the server. So installing is complex. Okay. 
So if I take the simple scenario about deploying uh, an ear file to a cluster, apparently it's, it's straightforward, right? All you need to do is deploy an ear file. But the reality is it's not that simple. You need to map your resources, map your bindings. Often I've worked in organisations where developers will give you an ear file, so there you go, it's ready to deploy. Yet the ear file has uh, environmental hard-coded values in it. So now you need a process of unpacking your ear file, finding those change, those uh, specific environment specific variables, replacing them for your replacing them for your specific environment, and then creating the ear file again. So you can deploy that to your specific environment. And then you've got your app specific context uh, configuration. Um, so things like um, uh, your, your web context that you're going to use, or your fast loading policies. So again, this is simple, allegedly, but it's not really, because there are a lot of items that you need to manage and you need to configure. And what you need to do is, is use a tool that can take those items and, and really just bring out the, the, the variables that you need to manage. So maybe it is just the um, context route that you want to change between environments. Okay, so you want to bring down your configuration and boil it down to the lowest common denominator of, of what, your, uh, what you need to change from environment to environment. Then if we go into a complex scenario, you need to then manage all of your resources of the cell. So, you know, we have all of the clusters, so that's managing the ports, the heap sizes, the JVMs, the JVM specific configuration. Um, all of the different servers within the cluster, you've got all of your different um, JMS, JDBC, uh, URL libraries, security, system integration bus, shared libraries, you know, the list goes on and on. There are literally thousands of things that you need to manage when you deploy this configuration. So you need a way of being able to um, deploy this configuration but simply, you want to just, again, take out the lowest common denominator. So if we take a simple deployment topology, which is in a development environment, you will be um, deploying to a one node, one cluster, one server. So even in a simple environment, simple topology, you have thousands of configuration items. So the size of your configuration, which is all XML, is going to be X. Okay. And then if you then go on to a production-like te topology, you have one cluster, two servers, two nodes. Now you've got 10 times 100 configuration items. It's 10x. So how are you going to manage all of these configuration items together? Okay. And let's take that scenario, you know, let's extend it even further. Now you're not splitting um, your your, your servers onto each node uh, equally, now you're directing and saying, okay, on, on one node we're having six and on another one four, so now you're having uh, directive deployments of, of cluster members for specific nodes. So these are all real life scenarios that, that you can be faced with. And, and what you need to do is simplify that deployment configuration. And you want to have the same deployment configuration if you're using the same deployment model or the same template to deploy your development topology to your production topology. You don't really want to change. And so what you want to do is you could use a, a tool, right, to snapshot the XML, right, copy that. Simple, right? Well, the reality is you can't do that because uh, the XML is massive and the XML is just you can't copy and, and uh, replace the XML. You must use an API to make these configuration changes. And so, uh, and again, the, the XML is totally different between the different environments because of the, the different XML IDs that the website uses. So the only difference you really have between these different topologies is the cluster member count. In development, it's one, and in production, it's ten. So you, you have your same deployment model, and then for environment one, you only have one item that you need to change for all of your different environments. You know, maybe you've got data source configuration as well. 
The only thing that's going to change is the, the URL for that data source. And that's the, the smallest uh, bit of information you want to take away from your deployment model, your template, and put it into the property files that you manage for your different environments. Okay, so some considerations when you do these deployments are about, uh, you know, you need to manage ports from all the cluster members on each node so there are no port conflicts. Um, what I would recommend is you, um, you manage ports by convention. So you always, when you create a new cluster member, you will increment the port count, the starting port count by 100, for example, or 1,000. And then um, you always will know that your, um, by convention, your port numbers that end 050 is always going to be your site port, for example. So you no longer have to manage you know, hundreds of different ports in your configuration. It's all done by convention. Because there are a lot of ports to manage when you come into uh, deploying to huge topologies. OK. So uh, finally, the key takeaways from uh, this presentation is continuous delivery is an ongoing process. It's not a one-off. It's something you need to keep building on and you need to keep applying, which is why I keep reiterating, just build small chunks and, and build on top of it. It is continuous, but you will reap the benefits. Use the, the, the 10 steps that I spoke about. Start small uh, and incrementally add to that, that uh, automation process. There are loads of tools out there, um, including uh, the one at my company, but just use the right tool for the right job. Okay? The previous speaker had the same message. Make sure you choose the right tools for the right job. A lot of these tools integrate with each other quite seamlessly. Jenkins obviously has lots of plugins. You know, um, uh, uh, Just make sure you work out what you're deploying, what type of, time, type of testing you're doing and choose the right tool for that job. Evaluate it carefully. So um, deploying to um, uh, automating isn't uh, easy, simplify it. So what I mean by that is you know, automating to heterogeneous environments where you've got many different uh, components and moving parts uh, isn't simple. So you want to simplify that configuration and bring it down to its uh, minimum um, minimum viable product really about what uh, is in the configuration, what's template against what's um, specific for the environment. It's a long process uh, implementing continuous delivery, but you know it's, it it does have a positive impact on the company. It should have a positive impact on on your jobs, and you know uh, just enjoy the process. So, uh, you know, finally I'd say have fun, enjoy it, and uh, thank you for your time today. That's, that's all I have. If you'd like any more information um, about um, my company, there's a website there. Um, we have a plugin for Jenkins that you can use, which will help you with your uh, release uh, <coughs> automation needs. So, finally that's it. Thank you very much.